Hello everyone. Today I will be doing a presentation on when Brent Franklin addresses the Constitutional Convention. So first, let's start out with who is Ben Franklin? According to Wood, Ben Franklin was a pseudonym for Richard Saunders, who was born January 17th, 1706 in Boston, Massachusetts, and died April 17th, 1790 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. For most of Franklin's life, America was split into the 13 colonies and was still under British rule. Franklin was the 10th son out of 17 children from his parents. Through his youth, he loved to read and write and he was a very fast learner. Fast forwarding to September 1st, 1730, he married a Deborah Reed, who seemed to be the only woman in Philadelphia to marry him because he brought an illegitimate son, William, who was born of a woman who was never identified in the history books. Franklin's common law marriage lasted until Deborah's death in 1774. Franklin's first co-op was securing the printing of Pennsylvania's paper currency. Franklin helped get this business by writing a modest inquiry into the nature and necessity of paper currency in 1729. And later he also became a public printer of New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland. Other money-making ventures included the Pennsylvania Gazette published by Franklin in 1729 and generally acknowledged as among the best colonial newspapers and Poor Richard's Almanac printed annually in 1732 to 1757. He became a clerk of Pennsylvania's legislator in 1736, a postmaker of Philadelphia in 1737, and prior to 1748, his most important political service was his part in organizing the militia for defense of the colony against a possible invasion of France and the Spaniards, whose privateers were operating on the Delaware River. And here are the 13 colonies. And as we know, Ben Franklin was the delegate who mainly always um, represented Pennsylvania, our home state, well, back then colony. Continued in 1748, Franklin at age 42 was wealthy enough to retire from his active business. In the winter of 1746 to 1747, that didn't stop him. Retirement did not stop him because he kept um, investigating things because Franklin and his three friends became interested in investigating electrical the electrical phenomenon. And by 1751, Collinson and Franklin's papers published an 86-page book entitled Experiments and Observation of Le on Electricity. However, according to Onion, the experiment he suggested to prove the identity of lightning and electricity was apparently first made in France before he tried a simpler, more dangerous experiment of flying a kite in a thunderstorm. But his other findings were original. He created the distinction between insulators and conductors. He invented the battery for storing electrical charges. He coined new Amer English words for new science of electricity, conductor, charge, discharge, condense, amateur, electrify, and others. In addition to electricity, he studied many other topics, including ocean currents, meteorology, causes of the common cold, refrigeration. He also came up with the Franklin stove, which used more heat, or which came up with more heat while using less fuel and other stoves. And he also created bifocals, which are today known as glasses to help reading and sight. All right, so here are the events leading up to the convention. So in 1754, a meeting at the colonial Representation representatives at Albany, New York, Franklin proposed a plan for uniting the colonies under National Congress. Although this Albany plan was rejected, it helped the groundwork for the Articles of Confederation that came up later, ratified in 1781. While Franklin was abroad in London until 1775, the British government began in the 1760s to impose a series of regulatory measures to have more control over the American colonies. Franklin returned to Philadelphia in May of May of 1775, shortly after the Revolutionary War. Spoiler alert, America won their freedom. And in 1776, he was a part of the five member committee that helped draft the Declaration of Independence in which the 13 colonies declared their freedom from the British rule. In 1781, the Articles of Confederation were ratified as spoken before. And this was created by the Second Con Continental Congress. And the purpose of the Articles of Confederation was to have 
a structure for a new government and a confederation of some kind. However, the Articles of Confederation lacked Congress control to regulate commerce, making it unable to protect and standardize trade between foreign nations and various states. So finally, by 1787, Franklin was the Pennsylvania delegate in the Constitutional Convention. This convention was to address the problems of the weak central government that existed under the Articles of Confederation. So the convention was to fix the weak, very weak constitution they already had because it was definitely not working for the America back then. And according to Sapphire, by the time Franklin started to address the continent, er, the constitutional convention, he was 82. He's the oldest man in the room. The room was filled of young men, half under 40 years old. And this speech, he's addressing everyone in the room, um, but mainly President Washington about the current constitution. In the first paragraph, Franklin accepts that he does not approve of the current Articles of Confederation, but he might, he's open-minded to the future to approve it if changes are made. As um, Franklin has gotten older, he said that he's learned more about how important it is to listen to others because many people believe they are the holders of truth. Much like religious believers, most religions have their own infallible doctrines that guide them and Franklin compares this concept to the people in general that believe in their own infallibility, because most people believe they're right and others are wrong. He connects this to the current constitution where he points out some of the men that initially wrote it are blind to its flaws, but he, he being one of the men who wrote it, r realizes from reflection that it needs desperate alterations if America wants to succeed. Then Franklin goes on to speak about how they need a general government for the country. He warns that if the founding fathers continue treating the country as it is and do not make any changes, it can turn into a despotism, AKA like a tyranny because of its lack of organization and the lack of um, United Peoples. Although he warns that giving too much power to the government who are full of people of prejudices, passions, error of opinions, selfish views, etc., is not wise. So you should not give too much power to the government. He also reminds his audience that the whole world is watching America and that they are ready to see America crumble because America was not like any country before and it has new ideas. It's under a new kind of government. Franklin does not want America to be a failure as everyone expected it to be. He wants to prove the world wrong, but he knows that the only way America can succeed is to unite the people and to unite the government. Lastly, he exclaims, the much of the strength and efficiency of a government in procuring and securing happiness to the people depends on opinion and the general opinion of goodness of that the government as well as the wisdom and integrity of its governors. Meaning that the people and the government work as a team and the government should be looking out for the people's best interest. So for the people's best interest, they, con in conclusion, they abandoned the Articles of Confederation and they accepted its faults and helped. And this helped learn to make change into a new constitution where the people's best interest was first. And this is first steps into the success of America. And in this video, we are going to learn what that constitution did for the people. So let's go. Had served in the army during the war, but one thing they all shared was a desire for a stronger national government. The delegates agreed on many things. The government should have executive, legislative, and judicial branches and should be Republican with representatives rather than direct democracy, but the devil appeared in the details. Alexander Hamilton, probably the biggest proponent of very strong government, wanted the president and Senate to serve life terms, for example. That idea went nowhere because the overarching concern of almost all the delegates was to create a government that would protect against both tyranny by the government itself and tyranny by the people. They didn't want too much government, but they also didn't want too much democracy, which is why our presidents are still technically elected, not directly by regular people, but by 538 members of the Electoral College. This system is so Byzantine and strange that when American politicians speak of spreading democracy through the world, they never actually advocate for American-style elections. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Yes, I know, you have faith.
inflation, and smaller states, fearing that the big boys would dominate, rallied behind the New Jersey plan. New Jersey. This called for a single legislative house with equal representation for each state, as with the Articles of Confederation. But of course, coming from New Jersey, it had no chance of succeeding, and sure enough, it didn't. Instead, we got the Great Compromise, brokered by Connecticut's Roger Sherman, which gave us two houses. A House of Representatives, with representation proportional to each state's population, and a Senate with two members from each state. House members, also called congressmen, served two-year terms, while senators served six-year terms, with one-third of them being up for election in every two-year cycle. And we still use this system today. So Franklin's um, opinion was that it, need, it changes, and he urged the rest of the men in the room to vote on a change to the Articles in a Confederation, and they did just that, and we still use part of the system today.